Uh, and thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. Big show tonight. Uh, there's a lot going on. We are keeping an eye out tonight on whether the president might make an extraordinary and early use of the pardon power uh, to pardon convicted former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio tonight. Uh, we've been getting mixed messages on that. The White House saying today that we don't expect an announcement about that soon, uh, but we're also told that the paperwork has been prepared already and uh, the talking points have been distributed to White House surrogates in terms of how they should talk about that when it happens. So uh, the White House doesn't always uh, speak officially for the president in terms of when he's going to do something and what. So we've got eyes on that tonight. That would obviously be a major national controversy if the president decides to do that. Uh, we've also got news tonight about a corruption scandal having to do with the new administration that may be uh, getting pursued now by an unlikely investigator. Uh, this is a very interesting story. We've got that coming up exclusively tonight. We've got that just in a couple minutes. And we've also got a couple of, um, a, a pair of national security stories tonight, one of which may raise your spirits in a way, um, and one which probably will flip your stomach over several times. So there's a lot going on. Um, but I want to start with something different. Before we get to that news tonight, I want to start with something a little, a little off the path. Um, something that, as far as I can tell, is basically an open question. And that is how I am raising it here on the air tonight. I want to basically explain this thing that we as a country have, been all, have all been able to figure out recently, within the last couple of days, because of good new investigative reporting that's been done by the New York Times. Uh, and the reason I want to talk about this part of it here is basically to, to plant a flag on this point. To, clarify this thing that we've just learned, basically to raise a flag as, as to whether the open question I think is, that is now raised can be answered. So I, I admit this is a little bit weird, but bear with me, I think it is worth it. All right, here's the story. A few years ago, a very wealthy Russian lawmaker, a billionaire who was a Russian lawmaker, he fled his country. He left Russia and he came to the United States because he said he feared for his life. He said a, a close ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin, a Russian oligarch very close to Putin, had confiscated billions of dollars from him. And when he sued that oligarch to get back his billions of dollars, the backlash was swift and scary. He says he was stripped of his immunity as a member of parliament. He was then charged with fraud, what he says were trumped up fraud charges. He says he was then quickly put on Russia's most wanted list. He said he was fearing for his life when he fled to the United States. And he started looking into the possibility of trying to get asylum here in the United States. He also continued to press his legal case against the Putin-linked oligarch who he claimed had stolen all those billions of dollars from him. And you know, if you've, if you've got enough juice and enough connections to steal billions of dollars from someone in Russia, naturally you don't take kindly to somebody pursuing you in court for that. So uh, the Putin-connected oligarch who's accused of stealing billions of dollars from this Russian lawmaker, the oligarch got to work uh, doing everything he could to mess with this guy who he'd supposedly stolen all this money from, to mess with this fugitive Russian lawmaker who was pressing this legal case against him including he, he mounted a campaign, a multifaceted campaign, to try to block that fugitive lawmaker guy from getting asylum in the United States. And in order to accomplish that objective, he hired a very special kind of DC operative. He hired a naturalized US citizen, originally from Russia, a guy with, we now know, extensive ties to Russian intelligence. And he was well known for being an effective pro-Putin, pro-Kremlin fixer and lobbyist in Washington, D.C. That Russian-born D.C. fixer was hired to run basically a smear campaign against the Russian lawmaker who fled to the United States. This fixer guy got hired to do the work. He did the work. When it, get, when it came time to get paid for the work, the fixer guy later admitted in court that the way he got paid for this job was that he was handed bags of $100 bills, uh, $70,000 or $80,000 at a time in a bag. Nice work if you can get it. Now, around the same time, the fugitive Russian lawmaker is, is both trying to get asylum in the United States, he's trying to defend himself from this cash money smear campaign that's being paid for by the guy who he says stole all his money back in Russia. 
and he's still pursuing his legal case against that guy to try to get all his money back. And around the time that this smear campaign was starting up against him, led by this Russian-born D.C. fixer guy, his lawyers, who were working on his original case against the oligarch guy, their computers got hacked. The lawyers were based in London. They were sent suspicious emails that contained spyware, malware. It was meant to infiltrate their computers. Luckily, the infection emails looked suspicious enough to the lawyers that they called in help and they took steps to protect themselves. They tried first to find out who had come after them in that way. They wanted to find out who had tried to infect their email and access their servers to steal documents. So they hired forensic experts who came in and did something I didn't really realize you could do, but apparently you can. The forensic experts they hired basically activated the malware that had been sent to these lawyers, but then they fed traceable documents into the spyware. It would be like if you were able to put a GPS tracker on your stolen car so you could follow your stolen car to the chop shop where they were going to cut it up for parts, right? Then you could not just bust the thieves who stole your car, you could bust the whole car thieving operation. So they put these traceable documents on the lawyer's computers, then they traced them as the malware in the lawyer's computers stole the documents. And when those traceable documents were opened up, the forensic experts could see where they were. And wouldn't you know it, where those documents got opened was on computers at the company of the Putin-connected oligarch who these lawyers were pursuing in court and who was funding that smear campaign against their client back in the United States. So that was 2011, interesting case. Then it happened again. A couple years later, that Russian-born, Kremlin-friendly DC fixer with ties to Russian intelligence, the guy who ran the smear campaign for the Russian oligarch that apparently included this sophisticated hacking and stealing operation on the guy's lawyer's computers, that same fixer guy in DC turned up working for another Russian oligarch close to Vladimir Putin. This was in 2013. This new oligarch connected to Putin, he owned a mining company that was headquartered in Europe. And he hired the Russian-born DC fixer guy to go after a rival company in his industry. He hired the fixer guy to go after a mining company called IMR, which is headquartered in Switzerland. And sure enough, they got hacked too, badly. This time it worked. Uh, the, the company's internal documents got hacked. They got stolen off the company's servers, and then they turned up leaked far and wide to try to cause maximum damage to IMR. Now, IMR did fight back. They sued the company of this Putin-connected Russian oligarch who they were up against in this business dispute. They sued his company, and they also sued the Russian-born DC fixer guy who the oligarch had hired to manage his dispute with IMR. They sued them. They sued them for computer espionage. An investigator working for the Swiss mining company for IMR testified in court that he followed the DC fixer guy to a coffee shop in London while he was investigating this computer espionage. He says he saw the DC fixer guy sit down with a person who appeared to be his client in this matter involving IMR. The investigator testified that he actually heard the fixer guy in that coffee shop explain to his client that his team had successfully hacked into the computers at IMR. The investigator testified that he then saw the DC fixer guy hand over a thumb drive at the coffee shop that he said, a thumb drive he said that contained the documents that had been stolen from IMR. The documents that ended up getting leaked all over the place to try to hurt IMR's business standing in this dispute with the Russian oligarch who had hired the fixer. Okay, so both of those hacking cases had been previously reported. They were interesting, like, you know, business crime stories, right? But this week, the New York Times figured out that there is a crucial link between both of those hacking stories. That fixer guy, this DC fixer, this Soviet-born DC fixer with extensive Russian intelligence ties. In both of these instances, he was the guy hired by Putin-connected oligarchs for both of these campaigns, and in both of these campaigns, opponents of the oligarchs who were paying him found themselves subjected to sophisticated hacking attacks designed to break into their computers, steal documents off their computer servers, and then use those documents against them in these disputes. The fixer guy in DC is in the middle of both of those cases. 
and the MO looks very much the same in both of those cases. And his name is Renat Akhmetshin. And if that name is familiar, it's because we now know that he was one of the people who went to that now famous meeting at Trump Tower last June with Donald Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner and the Trump campaign chair, Paul Manafort, and a Kremlin-connected lawyer who had been sold to the Trump campaign as someone who could deliver damaging information from the Russian government about Hillary Clinton. Now, what was Renat Akhmetshin doing in that meeting? Renat Akhmetshin's explanation for what he was doing at that meeting, all these weeks later, is still funny. He maintains that he just happened to be having lunch that day with the Kremlin-connected lawyer, and she spontaneously, like almost as a lark, invited him to come along. And so he went, having no idea where he was going or why. He doesn't even live in New York. <laughs> but miraculously, there he was having a BLT or whatever, minding his own business, when whoops, he ends up invited into a meeting starting right then inside the executive suite at Trump Tower with the president's son and the president's son-in-law and the guy who's running the Trump for president campaign. Hey, Renat, why don't you come along? More the merrier, it'll be fun. Have you met these guys? So no, we don't have any idea what he was really doing there, but we do know more now about his particular expertise, what he appears to be good at, what kind of services he has been able to offer the people who he has worked for over the years. I mean, there's no reason to think that Renat Akhmetshin is the actual hacker. He's not the Cheeto-eating drone at a computer terminal in St. Petersburg who's figuring out the code, right, for the malware. No, I mean, what we know he does or what he appears to have done in the past for his clients is that he's the guy who makes arrangements about this stuff. He's the guy who makes arrangements for targeted hacking to happen and for the material obtained by targeted hacking to be used to maximum benefit for his clients. He's apparently the one who arranges the hack and then weaponizes whatever is stolen in the hack. Who knows who his team is, who he has doing these hacks. But what the time has also now added to our, under, our understanding of this part of the case is all the different ways in which Renat Akhmetshin appears to be connected to Russian intelligence. When the deputy head of Russian intelligence had to come to Washington to do a dog and pony show a few years ago about some joint U.S.-Russian policy effort, the guy who shepherded him, or shepherded him around Washington and went to all his events with him was our friend, the D.C. fixer, Renat Akhmetshin the deputy head of Russian intelligence. Americans who came across him during his work in D.C. over the years say he openly alluded to his own past involvement with Russian intelligence. Quote, he did not make it a secret. Over the years, he told journalists quite openly that he had worked with the Russian military counterintelligence. A member of the National Security Council under George W. Bush says he came across Renat Akhmetshin frequently in Washington, D.C. He tells the Times, quote, he would boast about his ties and experience in Soviet intelligence and counterintelligence. And, of course, there's the fact that he ran operation after operation for oligarchs close to Vladimir Putin, who hired him to manage their business and financial disputes with people who soon found themselves subject to hacking attacks designed to infiltrate their computers and steal their stuff. So their stuff could be used against them in those disputes. Does this sound familiar? So that guy turns up at that Trump Tower meeting, just passing by. But that meeting on June 9th of last year, there's a couple of things that are very interesting about it. Number one, and I don't know how to explain this at all, but that meeting ended up being very closely held. There were a lot of people in that meeting. There were a lot of Russians in that meeting, and there were there was a Trump, a Kushner, and a Manafort in that meeting, too. It was a big meeting involving a lot of people, but it was quite closely held. Not many people knew about it for a long time. We have reason to believe that special counsel Robert Mueller and his team of investigators, they don't appear to have figured out about that meeting on their own. All indications are that Robert Mueller's team only started looking into that Trump Tower meeting and what happened there after it was reported in the New York Times. How come they didn't know about it? Also, Former MI6 agent Christopher Steele, with everything he figured out for the Trump-Russia dossier that's now back at the center of the scandal, in his reporting, his dossier that he created for Fusion GPS, he never mentioned the Trump Tower meeting. It's not in the dossier. He seems to have figured out a lot of other stuff. We also now know, so, so that, that's interesting, that it seems to have stayed under the radar for so long. 
which is unusual given the number of people in that meeting and who they were. But we also now know that by the time that meeting happened on June 9th, the DNC, the Democratic Party, and the Clinton campaign had already been hacked by Russian hackers. And so now, if you put the timeline back together with what we know now, you can now, you can now see that once the Democrats had had their servers hacked and all their documents stolen, that's when the senior leadership of the Trump campaign took this meeting with a guy who has extensive known experience in exactly that kind of hacking. This guy who has years of experiencing arranging the stealing of and weaponizing of hacked information for Russian political purposes. The day after the Trump Tower meeting, the weekend of June 10th and 11th, that's when the DNC and their IT consultants finally kicked out the Russian hackers that had been rooting around in their system for months. We still don't know exactly why they did it at that specific moment, except we know that at the time they were preparing to go public with what had happened to them. And indeed, the following week, it went public. That's when we all learned for the first time that the Russians had hacked the DNC's servers. We learned that the following week when the Washington Post reported on it. The day after that story broke, the Russians started leaking some of what they had hacked out of the DNC through Guccifer 2.0 and then DC leaks. And then the full weaponization of that hacked information started the following month in July with the WikiLeaks dump, timed perfectly and expertly to coincide with the start of the Democratic National Convention. Now we know that about who was in that meeting, and now we know what we know about that timing. So here's my question. <laughs> now that we know more about who was in the room with the Trump campaign, in that interim period between when the Democratic Party was hacked and when the Russians started turning the product of that hack back at the U.S. election and the U.S. media to help Trump and hurt Clinton, now that we know that a Russia-born DC fixer who apparently specialized in that kind of work was meeting with the upper echelons of the Trump campaign right then, how can we tell if there's a connection? Is there a connection between this operative being at that Trump Tower meeting, with that specific expertise under his belt? Is there a connection between that and the Russian attack on the DNC and the Clinton campaign and how the documents hacked out of the Clinton campaign and the DNC got repurposed into the campaign to hurt Hillary Clinton? Does Renat Akhmetshin's proximity to these previous hacking cases map technically with what happened at the DNC last year in terms of timing, in terms of tactics, in terms of just the way that operation ran? Is it the same fingerprints on all three? Because we're pretty sure that he's associated with the first two. And we know about the third one, and it really looks the same. Are the fingerprints the same on all three? Renat Akhmetshin would not answer our questions when we reached out to him for this story. But you know what? All of this should be answerable. I mean, certainly by trained investigators, but I'm guessing even in open source research and journalistic work here. So. There's a whole bunch of news to get to tonight, and we were, we're going to get to it now. But just stick a pin in this story, in, in that meeting, in that time frame, and specifically into that guy. Who's going to be the first to figure this part out? Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me, or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.